Dear participants, also on my behalf, a warm welcome, a good afternoon, good evening and good morning, because indeed you are attending uh, this webinar from across the globe. I am Luc Selderlo, Secretary General of uh, EASPD, uh, Support Providers for Persons with Disabilities, and also proud ambassador of the Zero Project. ESPD, my organization, and the Zero Project, we share the same ambition. Zero discrimination, zero exclusion. Over the last three days, we debated a wide range of issues. And these days were indeed very intense and enriching. And I would like to thank the Zero Project team for organizing such a great, such a fantastic event. As one of the last events, uh, we will have together with you uh, a debate on inclusive recovery. We all know what Corona, what COVID-19 did to all of us. And that is what we will uh, debate now. With a strong focus on the European Union, and we really hope that the discussion here will also uh, of use for the colleagues from uh, other continents. Hopefully, it can also inspire you in your actions, activities, and lobby work. Indeed, dear colleagues and friends, since a year almost, our human relations, our society, and our economy are in crisis. And here in Europe, the European policymakers, the European Commission, launched a set of instruments for inclusive recovery. A budget of 1.8 trillion euro is available in different shapes and forms to make this happen. The recovery should be driven by investing in green and investing in digitalization. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Will this inclusive recovery also work for persons with disabilities? Will it also work for the citizens with support needs? If it's not working for those with support needs, it fails. Dear participants, this morning I had a friendly chat with a job coach supporting uh, people on their way into the labor market. And she had two messages. Uh, for me, and actually for us here this evening. First message was, all this online working and online coaching is not working for people with significant support needs. We still have this digital divide. And her second message was, there are no more jobs available on the open labor market for persons with disabilities, and it might stay like that for the coming two, three years. So on the one hand, a very ambitious recovery plan, and on the other hand, the dark reality of the labor market uh, at this uh, point for persons with disabilities. So maybe we need a focused action plan to tackle it. That is what we will discuss the coming 50 minutes. We have with us uh, the European Union Commissioner for employment, Mr. Schmidt. We have a representative of the Portuguese presidency, a representative of the European Commission, the Inclusion and Disability Unit, and we have with us also the UN Special Rapporteur. Let's start by listening to the statement of Commissioner uh, Schmidt. Please, Commissioner Schmidt, we're all yours. Uh, we have no sound. The Commission's plans okay. for an inclusive recovery. Before the pandemic, only slightly over 50% of persons with disabilities participated in the labor market. This number is very low when compared to the 75% of participation of persons without disabilities. The pandemic is likely to aggravate the situation 
and persons with disabilities risk being particularly affected. And this is already happening. During the lockdowns, it has become clear that teleconferencing and remote working are not always accessible to all. I hope that with the help of the vaccines, we get the pandemic under control as soon as possible so that we can work on a just recovery. We have already laid the proper foundations. The EU has adopted the largest stimulus package ever, worth 1.8 trillion euros. The funds should be used in a way that achieves a more social and inclusive European Union. Countries are now working on their national recovery plans. These plans should pay attention to the needs of the persons with disabilities and those at risk of exclusion. We need to provide job opportunities for all. The transition to a digital economy provides such opportunities. It can help make products, services, and infrastructure accessible and create an inclusive society. In early March, the Commission will adopt the Social Pillar Action Plan. Principle 17 of the pillar explicitly refers to inclusion of people with disabilities to ensure living in dignity and to enable them to participate in the labor market and in society. We have to define concrete measures to achieve these objectives. We will present a new strategy for the rights of persons with disabilities for the coming decade. It will contribute to the full inclusion of persons with disabilities in society, free from discrimination and fully respecting their rights. Employment is among the priorities of the new strategy. Together with Member States, the Commission will work towards better labour market outcomes for persons with disabilities. The reinforced youth guarantee helps young people find jobs. It includes a focus on young people with disabilities. Finally, the European Skills Agenda promotes participation of learners with disabilities in mainstream vocational education and training. The Commission is working on different tracks. We are committed to improving the situation of persons with disabilities on the labour market. And we will support Member States to be disability inclusive in their recovery efforts. As this conference is coming to a close, I welcome our commitment to all work together towards a more inclusive and accessible Europe. Thank you very much, dear Commissioner. Although it was a video message, uh, I still would like to thank the Commissioner for uh, making some of his time uh, available to us and, and, and thank him for the important contribution to the debate. We will come back to it uh, in the debate. Dear participants, uh, I would like to make uh, this session, it's Friday afternoon, at least for the Europeans, uh, a bit uh, a bit interactive, uh, as interactive as possible. So please feel free to use the uh, chat box uh, that uh, we will try to pick up the questions or the remarks that you put there to make it uh, more lively. But we have a very good panel. So let's now uh, see what the different uh, representatives of the different institutions uh, can uh, bring in uh, at this stage. And I would first like uh, to turn to uh, uh, a representative of the European Parliament, Mr. Brando Benefe. Uh, are you with us, uh, Brando? Can you hear us? No, there seems to be a technical issue. 
Then I turn to, uh, we will take care of that. The technical unit is working on it. Then I turn to the representative of uh, the Portuguese presidency, uh, the permanent uh, representation of Portugal, Mr. Bruno uh, uh, Barata. Um, Bruno, uh, your country has the presidency of uh, the European Commission uh, for six months. Uh, to which extent will the employment of persons with a disability be on the agenda of your, your presidency? Do you see ways on how you can tackle this very challenging situation uh, that, we, that we have to face now for, for persons with support needs uh, and their access to the, to the labour market? What do you have uh, in mind? What uh, will come out of your presidency? Please. Hello, good afternoon or good morning to, to all the people are in the, another continent. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, you for the invitation and express my satisfaction to discuss this fundamental priority with my panel colleagues. Uh, secondly, uh, it is important to stress the, the Portuguese presidency of the Council of European Union chose as one of its main priorities to give concrete meaning to the European pillar of social rights in citizens' life. For doing so, uh, we will organize the social summit of Porto in May to give political incentive to the implementation of European pillar of social rights. The, the action plan that will implement the pillar will deliver new and more effective rights for the citizens. It will then open 20 fundamental principles. Uh, Commissary Smith talked about the principle 17, but in our opinion, uh, persons with disabilities are in all the principles and in all the categories of the pillar. If uh, only for, for remember you, the three categories of the pillar is equal opportunities and access to the labor market. Works for all the people. Second category, fair work conditions. It's for all the people. And the third one, social protection and inclusion. So, uh, in these three categories, we have the, the persons with disabilities. It's very important to stress that. Uh, some, may, uh, some may say th that these documents and the, the principles and the objectives invited are utopian or a chimera. I understand when uh, people say that. But I don't see it this way. Uh, I, I, I like to, to quote uh, Pepe Mujica lesson. They argue that uh, politics is the struggle for human happiness, although it sounds like a chimera. And we have to follow the principles, the utopians and the chimera and the principles. It's real, it's, it's possible. Um, for the Portuguese uh, president, uh, presidency, persons with disabilities stands at the top of our priorities. And to mark the, the political agenda, we will organize a high-level conference of two days on 19th and 20th of April. We also intend to present a council conclusions about persons with disabilities, inspired in the Commission's disability rights strategy for 2021-2030. The, the council conclusions we are preparing are also an invitation for the member states to develop and implement the strategy in each member, member states. The dimension of employment is crucial. And uh, Commissar Schmidt said that is, is in the top. And if you see the report evaluating the European Disability Strategy of 2010 2020, 
uh, the employment is uh, the, the big dimension of uh, this report. Um, still, there is much work to be done to al align reality with the treaties. Nevertheless, it's important to say we, the European Union, and all the stakeholders um, have achieved a lot regarding these jobs in the last decades. Of course, it will always be unfinished path. Therefore, it is mandatory to do it with enthusiasm, strength, and and in end. It's yeah, it's yeah. it's essential. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno. I might come back to you with, with a question with regard to the need for a, a dedicated work plan, action plan, uh, yes or no. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Brando Benefe, uh, member of the European Parliament, uh, joined us. Uh, and I would like to turn to, to Brando uh, right now. But I also would like to uh, inform you that in the chat box, um, our rapporteur, uh, Thomas Bignell, has put a link to the, for those that are less familiar with the European pillar on social rights, there is a link there where you can find more information on uh, this uh, important uh, document uh, that indeed steers social policies uh, at European Union level. Uh, Brando, uh, question uh, for you. Thank you for joining us um, as a uh, member of the European Parliament. The, Due to COVID-19, we see that there is a sort of a standstill uh, in terms of employment opportunities for persons with a disability uh, on, the, on the labour market. Uh, no jobs are offered to people anymore. Um, and that, of course, is linked to, to, to the economy and the difficulties in which our economy is. But we see quite often that persons with a disability go last in and first out when you talk about uh, the labour market. Uh, so, should the European Parliament tackle this? Do we need a sort of a dedicated action plan, maybe proposed by the European Parliament, pushed by the European Parliament? Uh, Brando, you have the floor. Cannot hear you, Brando. Your microphone. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you for uh, for um, for this occasion. Sorry for joining late, but I was having a problem with the link. Uh, now it, uh, it works. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I I think yes that we need uh, absolutely to to have a, a plan on on this from the European uh, Parliament. Uh, I think we should push for that. Uh, because I, I think that what happened with the COVID uh, and with the pandemic uh, has created more need of support and more need of involvement, in fact, of your word, um, into uh, a, a process of, of which we have discussed a lot of times, that is the co-designing of policies with the, uh, with the organizations on the ground and also with the users, in fact, in this case, with people that are uh, in need of this uh, kind of, uh, of, social, of social support. Um, in my view, uh, it would be extremely important that the, that the recovery plans at national level in each of the European uh, um, Union countries will be able to uh, deliver um, support um, uh, for uh, uh, personalized care uh, in a way that can complement the efforts that were already put in place uh, through the European uh, uh, Union existing uh, funds in the European budget and also uh, as you have suggested, maybe with uh, some complementary indication coming at, from a political level uh, from, uh, first of all, the European, uh, the European uh, Parliament. Um, I really think that this is, uh, uh, um, this is crucial because we will have problems with the employment of, of uh, a lot of different uh, uh, categories of vulnerable groups. Uh, and, these, uh, uh, and we know we, we, all the debate about the various uh, um, opportunities that the European Union has put in place with the usage of European funds. I've been uh, myself uh, working a lot, as you know, on the Euro European Social Fund Plus, for example, to uh, support uh, 
um, uh, training, to support uh, lifelong learning, to support uh, uh, also specific uh, uh, paths toward uh, uh, inclusion in labor, in employment. Uh, but I think that we have, an, an, a, a, as I was trying to say, on, on a, a larger scale, we have a, 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 an opportunity that will not come back, that is to use, especially in some countries, that will have a significant amount of resources, um, the recovery plan money to um, uh, 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 develop plans and actions on the ground to an extent that was not possible uh, before. Um, and, and I, Rando, sorry for interrupting uh, you, but what can the European Parliament do, what can you do uh, to, to make sure that these recovery plans go in the right direction? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, as we know, we, 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 we have an already worsened situation, so we will need to be able to give guidance when we will now, in the next uh, stages, this is an information I think is important to give you in this context, that the European Parliament is creating a monitoring uh, group uh, with the committees, especially the economic and budgetary committees that were working on the recovery plans, but with all committees involved, to um, monitor how the, the, the various pillars, uh, and one of them is the cohesion policy and the social policy in the recovery plan, you know, is the third pillar uh, alongside uh, environmental and uh, digital policy. Uh, we, we need to have a strong push from here uh, so that there is a, a putting in place of the right policies for employment of disabled people also in the recovery plan. So the European Parliament uh, will exert influence and through this, 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 uh, this uh, uh, monitoring group that is being built, uh, and we will push through the European Commission okay. also uh, yep. and directly with the member states. Okay, thank, thank you very much, you. Rando. Uh, I hope to be able to come back to you uh, uh, later on, uh, uh, responding or reacting to what is said by the other uh, panelists. Let's let's turn to to the European Commission now, and we have with us uh, the disability expert of the European Commission, uh, Ima Plasencia Porero. Uh, Ima, thank you very much for making some of your time uh, available to us. Uh, no jobs anymore on the labour market for persons with a disability. Targeted actions might be needed. What can or what should your DG, what should your department of the Commission uh, do? What is in the pipeline? Do you have uh, good news for us? Um, please, you have the floor. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that uh, indeed, I mean, persons, the situation of persons with disabilities has been tremendously affected by uh, this, uh, this crisis. And what we have seen is also that uh, many, as uh, Commissioner Smith also referred to, many of the solutions that have been put in place uh, for people to continue working. Um, have not been uh, developed uh, having in mind persons with disabilities. Still, I mean, look at teleconferencing systems or uh, remote working, uh, remote working uh, solutions. There is a lot still to be done in that area. So these um, uh, new working environments add at a disadvantage uh, to the situ as a disadvantages to the situation of persons with disabilities on employment. I have to say that um, we have to work work in two, in two, let's say, in two um, directions. One is, of course, and it has been extensively mentioned, in using the funds that are going to be placed um, uh, in the market uh, to uh, recovery, recovery funds, but also the other funds, the, the structural funds uh, and um, uh, the, the, the response funds to the, to the COVID. To, to maximize their use and to make them, uh, implement them in a way that are disability inclusive, but also that um, are uh, going to be used to, to improve accessibility so that persons with disabilities can really participate in society and economy. That is one strand in which we need really to work. The other one is um, on maximizing the use that we of the tools that we have already at our disposal. In these circumstances where employment is going to be a cars, we need to be extremely careful to discrimination, uh, protection from protecting persons with disabilities from discrimination, but also 
to make sure that new practices for employment in terms of recruiting, for example, artificial intelligence is now being used to recruit people online, that they do not create new forms of discrimination that we have not been used uh, to. So we need to maximize uh, the opportunities that uh, the legal framework for discrimination uh, give us. We have also to, um, um, uh, in this um, second strand of, of maximizing the use of the tools that we have, to to use as much as possible the opportunities that state aid gives us, um, the opportunities that public procurement legislation gives us uh, to reserve contracts, for example, for persons with disabilities. We have to uh, maximize the youth of uh, of initiatives such as the 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 youth uh, the youth guarantee and uh, the new the new uh, funds of course we also need to be very attentive to the monitoring uh, of the situation we have been doing um, monitoring and um, lo looking at the situation in employment of the member states um, uh, through um, uh, statistical data that uh, has been uh, collected by um, our uh, contractors um, and um, we have some good news for the future in the sense that the labor for survey will contain uh, a disability question which would allow us to have much more information, not only about the number of persons with disabilities, but the conditions of employment of persons with disabilities, because this is essential to define policies um, for which we need to act. And we need, and we will continue feeding this information into the into the European uh, semester. Of course, we are coming uh, soon with a new disability strategy. And uh, while um, I cannot... Um, anticipate uh, uh, in detail its content, I can certainly reassure, as this has been done by uh, uh, my uh, commissioner, that employment will figure as a very important uh, point in, in this strategy. Um, we have been looking to additional instruments that, for example, could be um, uh, called to, to, to improve the situation. We have networks of public employment services, uh, and we know that um, there is a need to um, enhance the knowledge, the capacity, the ability to uh, provide accommodation for persons with disabilities in the workplace. And it's important to see how uh, these existing networks can, uh, can really uh, help for the for that um, for that uh, purpose, of course, um, training uh, remains essential. Uh, training uh, also on new technologies, on accessible technologies, on the use of assistive technologies is also very important. And uh, I would also um, I would also uh, like uh, to to mention um, the need to support. Um, um, social um, social employment entrepreneurship among persons with disabilities, for which we're going to come soon, also in among other other uh, issues covered, um, uh, with a new action plan on the social economy. We think that really uh, the social economy offers uh, opportunities that need to be uh, really really uh, uh, better uh, better used for this purpose. Um, there are, um, uh, as I said, the issue also of vocational rehabilitation, vocational training. Let's not forget uh, that um, uh, this type of, of, of um, uh, centers create, have a role to play in, uh, in the new, in particular in this new economic situation. But uh, let's maximize the tools in order to ensure that the conditions in those um, uh, settings are really um, respectful of the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, all these are elements that are being uh, considered in the in the new strategy, and I hope really that by the 3rd of um, March, which is the targeted date uh, for publication, we will be able to um, uh, discuss in more detail um, the, the contents uh, of the strategy and uh, work together with all the stakeholders uh, to implement the uh, new initiatives that we will put there. Thank you. I can't hear you.
Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Emma, for your contribution. Uh, and I hope to be able to come back to you with, with maybe a, a second uh, round of, uh, of questions. Uh, I would li now like uh, to turn uh, to um, Professor Gerard Quinn. But before doing that, I would like to remind you that you can find in the chat box more information for those that are not so familiar with these instruments and this jargon, more information on the ESF, the European Social Fund, on the recovery, resilience and recovery uh, initiatives of the European institutions and on anti-discrimination uh, legislation. So our rapporteur has put uh, some very uh, interesting uh, links there uh, if you would like to uh, know more on how these things work uh, in the European uh, Union. Um, Gerard, you are a um, special rapporteur, UN special rapporteur. You have a sort of a, let's say, bird perspective on what is going on uh, worldwide. Uh, also, I think uh, the UN uh, and you, you are uh, very well aware of the fact that we have a, a huge problem with regard to employment opportunities for people uh, with disabilities, with support needs. Uh, this COVID-19 crisis is really... Um, in a way, undermining the entire system that we have uh, set up uh, over the last uh, decade. Uh, what is your advice to the, uh, to the European institutions? Uh, do we need a sort of a focused action plan? What are the possible pitfalls? Please, uh, Gerard, you have the floor. Thank you, Luke. It's a real honour and pleasure to be with you. Um, as, I, as you say, I'm coming at this wearing my hat as UN Special Rapporteur. I have a particular interest in the role of regional organizations like the African Union, ASEAN, Organization of American States, and of course, the European Union. Um, and looking from the outside, I think it's important to keep reminding ourselves that work is incredibly important for independence in other aspects of our lives, it's very important for social belonging, and it's also incredibly important to connect the individual with more collective efforts, particularly national growth and so forth. So it's not just um, um, an individual right that's at stake, it's a lot more, actually. And I think there's a huge legacy in this uh, of disadvantage, and this was rightly pointed out by Commissioner Schmidt. There is... Um, a huge disability employment gap right throughout the world. There also is a huge disability payment gap. For example, in other parts of the world, people with disabilities only earn, on average, one quarter of the average worker in employment. And we all know that that's a mix of um, a lot of factors, including uh, an educational system that doesn't impart enough marketable skills, that's not to say that that's the only purpose of education, but nevertheless, it lets us down there. As Emma said, it's also um, a result of discrimination in the workplace. Um, it's a result of imperfect markets, not being attuned, attuned to human capability. And market imperfection is one of the first reasons why states should intervene and regulate. It's also due to a lack of support in employment, and we do need to grow the ecosystem of support to enable people um, get into employment and retain employment. And it's also due to anxiety about the coverage of the additional costs of disability, the interaction between social protection systems uh, and employment systems. COVID has revealed the need for structural change, but actually structural change is happening anyhow. So we have really um, an opportunity to influence um, structural change. It only comes once in a lifetime, and it's really important that it's used well. Again, looking at it from the outside, there are two instruments that ought to be informing um, how governments, how institutions respond to this structural change. One is the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I think that's especially important during periods of structural change. You may recall there's a new vision in the UN SDGs on kind of a circular motion between the economy, society, and the environment. 
And I think EU law and policy captures that fairly well. Also, there is a moral priority in the UN SDGs, and it's emblazoned right on the front of the UN SDGs. Treat those who've been furthest left behind first and leave no one behind as we rebuild. The way I see this, indeed the way the Office of the High Commission sees this, is it requires both mainstreaming and targeted measures because otherwise a rising tide will not lift all of the boats. Uh, sustainable Development Goal 8 deals with decent work. Also, we have the UNCRPD, which thankfully the European Union and all of its member states have ratified. And it's kind of a more person-centered grounding to systems as they adjust to structural change into the future. It foresees active market participant participation, nudging private market actors in the right way, supported by social action and active supports, uh, encouraging entrepreneurship and access to capital. That's incredibly important. And it also foresees community-based supports and a transition away from traditional service paradigms. Very, very usefully, just last month, the Office of the High Commission produced a very detailed resource pack on how to combine the UN SDGs with structural change with the UN CRPD from the individual's point of view, and I highly commend that to you. What about the structural change? And I'll stop here, Luke. You'll be glad to hear. Uh, you're right, Luke. The old jobs are not coming back. Um, we can't fully predict the shape of the new markets to evolve into the future, but there will be new uh, employment types emerging. We can predict that new market opportunities will leave even furthest behind those who are already far behind, unless there's some intentional work put into it. E even a glance at the McKinsey report on the future of work tells us that, and that was done before the COVID crisis. Uh, the drivers of change, I think Emma already pointed to them, the, the emergence of the digital economy in both consumption and production. And, and Emma quite, pointed to, quite rightly pointed to the onset of artificial intelligence as both something that gives us advantages, but there are real risks here. And I would say that really needs to be looked at. The green economy will throw up new jobs in unpredictable ways. And also, and this was predicted by, by McKinsey, all of the informal caring roles in society will gradually be admitted into the, in, the formal economy and people with disabilities have a lot to gain on both sides of that ledger. And this to me is why the EU instruments to respond have to be sensitized to this ability on the basis of do no harm, try to mitigate the worst impacts, maximize the new potentials, and that really depends on where you see the new employment potentials emerging uh, as we restructure our markets, uh, integrate disability perspectives where you can, but also, I think, add targeted measures where, are, where they are needed. And that requires a judgment as to where the best multiplier effects can be obtained. Mm -hmm. And uh, back to you, Luke. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Gerard, for, the, for your contribution. Uh, clear and, and, and focused, uh, as always. Jera, do you have knowledge of, of uh, places, other places on, on Earth, so to say, where they have uh, uh, interesting plants in the pipeline, where we can learn uh, from uh, exactly with regard to, to having this disability perspective in recovery plans, in strategies? Well, just before COVID hit, the ILO did a major report on the future of work for persons with disabilities. And I think they're continuing that work with uh, comparative surveys on best practice. So that, that's one to watch. Um, that's where I would be gaining most of my information. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try to, to, to have another round of uh, questions, but I must ask the panelists to be, to be very brief in their replies. Uh, there is a question, and that is uh, uh, for, for Ima, maybe, on uh, how to make sure that, uh, indeed, uh, technology uh, is uh, not only available, but also uh, affordable and accessible. But maybe first to, to Brando. Brando, uh, 1.8 trillion euro for the recovery plan. How to avoid that this goes in, uh, let's say, the pockets of the multinationals that without any doubt will do great things with all this money. But how to make sure that this will be used in an inclusive way? Uh, you're muted, Brando. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I'm convinced that the the best way to to be sure that the money is used uh, in, towards the objectives that are for the common uh, interest is that we have a strong involvement of civil uh, society in uh, monitoring, in being part of the uh, ongoing uh, uh, implementation of all the projects. Um, I mean, you mentioned the 1.8 billion, uh, trillion, trillion, trillion. trillion <laughs> yes, yes, trillion. That means that you summed up the budget, the multi-annual financial framework and the next generation EU. And in both of them, I'm happy that I, I managed to win to some extent in the negotiation with the Council for the ES, ESF Plus, the European Social Fund Plus, we included the mandatory consultation of civil society in the new uh, programming, and, and we strengthened this dimension already inside the traditional European budget. Now we hope that also the recovery plans, thanks to our efforts, can take the same direction. The, the re national recovery plans needs to be monitored by organizations like the ones you, you know you work with, you are part of your network, that can ensure that we don't look for the interests of, uh, of the few, but for uh, the interests of the many that you serve every day for, with, your, with your work. I have to apologize. I need to leave now. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Brando. And we will need you the months and years to come to yes. keep this on the agenda. A question to, to Bruno, maybe. Bruno, what, what will be um, the advice to the next presidency? What will you put in the council recommendations with regard to the employment of uh, persons with a disability in the post-corona uh, era. Let's hope that indeed, uh, in, in in a few months from now, the situation will will uh, improve. Uh, Bruno, please. Hello again. Thank you for the question. And um, uh, as I said uh, before, uh, the, the the council conclusions uh, uh, for uh, people uh, persons with disabilities. It's the, our intention to put in the top of political agenda, and in Marseille, the the new strategy are, I think, ready in a couple of weeks, and uh, after that, we work uh, in the in the document to stress the importance uh, of the the new strategy. But I want I want to, to stress uh, uh, one one topic uh, Inma uh, are talking about is about social economy. It's it's a, a very important uh, topic because uh, our presidency believes that social economy contributes to the objectives of the European Union, including inclusive and sustainable ground economic, social, and uh, ter ter territorial. Uh, it's an essential tool for, for people, the, the social economy, uh, particularly in the support it gives to the most vulnerable groups, helping to reduce inequalities and in promotion and guarantee the human di dignity. And uh, in, in these current times, we are living now, uh, social economy is playing an inextricable vital role. It's a very important. And um, 
we we the, the Portuguese presidency uh, want to prioritize also this topic during our presidency, and uh, it must say the, the action plan for the social economy will be presented at the end of the year, November, December, uh, and in the Slovenia presidency. But uh, our presidency will trigger the debate. And for that, we also have a high-level conference on social economy in 29th of March. And uh, it's uh, uh, assigning uh, also a declaration for uh, support the presentation of European Action Plan for Social Economy. And uh, for example, in the next week, I suppose, uh, 5th of March, we will present the, the business, uh, uh, business social economy report in our uh, working party of social questions to uh, start and kick off this, uh, this important uh, topic okay. and put in our agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Uh, Ima, maybe uh, uh, brief, if possible, the question on uh, availability and affordability of uh, AT and, in, in general, technology, also for persons with support needs, which are quite often uh, uh, also at risk of uh, living in poverty. We can't hear you, Emma, your microphone. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I was uh, forgetting to unmute. So, let me start at, uh, to, to say that um, we need to distinguish uh, in this case of what needs to be done in order to make technology affordable in two main categories of technology. Mainstream technology, which is uh, has to be made accessible, and assistive technologies that are, per definition, targeted to uh, persons with, uh, with disabilities. In relation to mainstream accessible technologies, I think we have put in place quite a number of um, instruments, uh, legal instruments. I'm a firm believer that the legal instruments like the Accessibility Act, the Web Directive, the Telecommunications Framework, the Audiovisual Media Services, the Public Procurement Directive, they all contain provisions requiring accessibility. Of course, the funds can finance accessibility of technology. And uh, what we see is that while the uh, amount of accessibility is increasing at a good path, I would not dare to say exponentially, the prices are dropping down. And this is, for me, one of the, be the, the best indicators that accessibility does not make the cost of technology uh, increase, because really, is we are faced with with a contra uh, reality. Yep, uh, so we need to enforce the legislation. We need to have standards for its implementation. We need to train persons with disabilities, but also professionals in the yes. area of ICT, in order to, and in also in the social services to use these accessible uh, those accessible technologies. This is very important, and we need to raise awareness. In that context, I would like to mention that we are organizing together with the Portuguese presidency an event uh, called ICT Europe for All in um, in March, in the 20th of March, that will address um, accessibility of technologies. Okay. When it yeah. comes to assistive technology, and I finish, yes, the situation. Please is different that the situation is different prices remain incredibly high mm -hmm. very very high it's difficult to justify that the technological component in those uh, devices is the reason why those devices are so expensive so we need to find the argumentation or the reasons for that um, uh, high cost in other elements of those devices uh, fragmentations of markets uh, testing different certifications quite a number of things that um, are not really the technology itself, the situation, uh, the precarious situation of companies, and so forth and so forth. So yeah. we will be working in both areas in the new uh, strategy. Look, sorry, you asked me. You asked me uh, one of my favorite questions. I know, I know, I know. It's, it's <laughs> and I'm really uh, extending myself. So is, I cut, I stop now. Thank you Indeed. for the question. <laughs> Thank you, Ima, and we all know how hard you worked uh, in this field over the last years. Uh, maybe a quick uh, final question to, to Gerard, and then we turn to our rapporteur. Uh, Gerard, uh, are you optimistic? Is there hope? Or will we have to 
su tried to survive. Thinking back about the impact of the financial crisis, uh, I'm not so optimistic at the moment. So, w what do you think? Microphone, please. I'd be slightly more optimistic, Luke. Um, I think um, one of the representatives of the EU at the third committee of the General Assembly in New York about two months ago was very, very forthcoming in acknowledging that COVID has revealed deep-seated inequalities affecting people with disabilities and others, like older people, for example. And there seems to be a consciousness now that the way we've done things in the past should not be the way we do things in the future. Mm -hmm. The European Union is blessed in that it has available to it instruments of a wide variety to leverage change. So I think if you can mix together the political motive to really rebuild in a different way um, with maximizing those tools, you stand a much better chance than, for example, mm -hmm. other regions mm -hmm. in the world, and many will look to you. I very much liked um, Bruno's image of the social economy um, and developing that, and I was thinking to myself um, that the potential of public procurement has not really been realized, and maybe we can do something very active on that in the future, uh, uh, uh. and also that state aid rules might be... Um, relax somewhat to enable that to occur. So, so I'm, I would be somewhat more optimistic. Perfect. Yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, Gerard. And indeed, I think that the European uh, Union uh, is, is uh, in, in a sort of a privileged position because we have indeed uh, an interesting toolbox with, with instruments to, to tackle the crisis. Uh, turning to our rapporteur, uh, Thomas, if you have to summarize this debate in two or three key messages. What would that be? Thomas, please. Thank you, Luke, and thank you, everyone, for this uh, interesting panel. Uh, not bad for, for a Friday evening. Um, we've heard a lot about leaving no one behind, inclusive recovery, uh, treat those excluded first. Uh, these are important words, but we, make, we have to make sure that they become uh, a reality. And uh, I think the, the one important point to, to, to look into is, is the employment of persons with disabilities. It will really be a stress test for Europe and, and for the world uh, in the years to come. And I think we will be judged in that uh, regard in the, in, in the next decades. Um, we've talked a lot about the toolbox, the toolkit that we have available, uh, both at national level, but also within the European Union. We know what's effective. The last few days, we've discussed this uh, a lot in the different workshops, the different panels, uh, accessibility, very important. Uh, motivating employers, guidance, job coaching, subsidies, all very important. Making sure we have the right funding, in particular also for the organizations that help the employment of persons with disabilities, support and employment agencies, social economy enterprises, et cetera. Um, we also need to make sure that people with disabilities have the right skills uh, and, and workplace learning is key to that, uh, indeed. Um, we've also been discussing a lot the, the digital transitions, the green transitions, and these are all very important and will bring great changes to, to many, but we really need to work significantly on making sure that they're also an advantage for persons with disabilities, and that does require some thinking and some investment. A lot of this can be done at national level in the countries and the towns uh, around Europe and the world, uh, but the European Union also has a lot of tools at, at its uh, availability. The EU Disability Strategy will be launched uh, next March. Uh, that's an opportunity. The EU Recovery Funds, these 1.8 trillion euros, 1.8 trillion euros, Surely that we can make a difference uh, with that amount of money. Uh, we've just talked about public procurement. Uh, what 14% of, of public spending is, is done in, through public procurement. Uh, surely we can make sure we can create some jobs uh, for people with disabilities there. State aid is very important. Um, the skills agenda, uh, and we talked about also about the public employment services, uh, and they have a very important role to play. So plenty of, uh, we know what's effective, we know what's available, now we need to make it work. And we look forward to working on that in the next few weeks on the European Disability Strategy, both with the Commission, the Parliament, and with the uh, Council, and particularly with the Portuguese Presidency. That's it for my conclusions, and thank you, everybody.
Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. And we will put these conclusions uh, uh, on our website, uh, the SPD website, and we will make it available to the uh, uh, Zero Project uh, partners and, and uh, instruments as well. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all uh, speakers for their uh, very interesting contribution. Uh, Ima, thank you very much. Bruno, thank you. Professor Quinn, Gerard, thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, Brando, you have to, to leave us already, but I would like to thank him for his contribution. Also, Commissioner Schmidt, your contribution was, I think, more than uh, useful. So thank you uh, very much. I wish you all uh, a very nice, re relaxing evening. Uh, and uh, on Monday, we start to work on the implementation of what we discussed now. I wish you all a relaxing uh, weekend. And I hope that for the non-Europeans that were with us, uh, during this uh, webinar. I hope that this uh, can also be of use for you and that it can inspire you in your work uh, and in your activities. Again, congratulations to the Zero team for organizing such a fantastic, breathtaking uh, three days. Thank you very much, dear uh, uh, Zero um, people. Thank you and see you next year. Bye-bye. Thank you.